of all the meditation techniques recommended by the Buddha, there's probably none that excites as much complaint as contemplation of the body. I remember when I came back from Thailand, there were a lot of books out, feminist scholars complaining about this meditation, saying that it did violence to women, ignoring the fact that the monks are supposed to start the contemplation by contemplating their own bodies. Every description in the canon starts with, you look at your own body and you take it apart piece by piece. And what do you have in the body? Is there anything worth lusting for? Anything worth making yourself proud about? The color of your skin? Or if you took your skin off and just put it on the floor, would well, you think that was beautiful, special, better than other people's? Well, no. And the whole purpose of this is to get rid of your sense of infatuation with your own body. Because as the Buddha points out, our attraction to other people starts with attraction to our own bodies. And then secondly, the idea that contemplating other people's bodies does violence to them is totally misconstrued. Some people say, how can you have goodwill, compassion, kindness for someone who you're mentally taking apart? You're not taking them apart, you're taking apart your own vision of their body. Remember the Buddhist definition of how craving works. It has a location. And often the location is not where you think it is. You say you may desire somebody else. But what do you actually desire? You desire your perception of that person, your fantasies about that person. And then you justify your fantasies saying, we well, have affection for the other person. Confusing lust with affection like this, that's probably one of the most deluded things in the world. Think about cases of molesters. They think that they're showing affection. But the way they show affection is not affectionate at all, not kind at all. So if you think that you're being unkind to somebody by analyzing their body like that, you've got to question your equation of lust with affection, and realize that what you're taking apart, what you're doing violence to, is your own set of lustful intentions. So there's nothing unkind about this meditation, nothing that does violence to anybody. In fact, when you can overcome your lust like this, you're much less likely to do violence to others. They say that most murders happen between people who've had sex. You think of, I think it was Marlene Dietrich, who said nothing spoils a good friendship like sex. So that question of how can we have compassion for others and do body contemplation at the same time is totally deluded. It comes from delusion of some of the worst sort. Thinking that somehow your lust can be justified by affection. That's where the violence is, is in the lust. So learn how to take it apart, this fantasy you have in your mind. Try to figure out where, where is the lust located, where is the craving located? Is it in a particular perception of the other person? Is it in a perception about yourself, the fact that you're attractive and that you can seduce others? Try to be frank with yourself, be honest with yourself, because in this particular issue there's so little honesty. even between people who love each other. A lot of this aspect of the desire has a lot of dishonesty. So look into it. This is the really compassionate thing, is learning how to overcome your greed, your aversion, your delusion, your lust, all the defilements. You realize that they're the enemy. The people who tend to focus on as exciting your lust they're just excuses. The origination of lust comes from within, and it's combined with all kinds of other things. There's pride sometimes. There's resentment. Not all lust is based on liking somebody. 
you have to figure out what are the what is this cluster of defilements that you're labeling affection, love, whatever. You realize that it's a pretty toxic combination. It's because of these things that we keep coming back, coming back, coming back. And even just as an act of kindness to yourself, you want to learn how to get some distance from your own body. Because if you identify very strongly with your body, then when you die, where are you going to go? I've mentioned the story about a John Fern who, when he was teaching in Bangkok, would find that Saturday evenings he didn't have many people coming in to see him because most of them would come during the day. So Saturday evenings he was free. He would sometimes take advantage of that time to walk around the monastery, which was a Kermitian monastery, and a series of pavilions, about sixteen altogether. And they could have as many as sixteen funerals at a time. They placed the coffin at one end of the pavilion. Monks would sit on a platform going down the side of the pavilion chanting. Lay people would sit and listen to the chants. It was about that time of the evening when John Fuhr would go around. He came back one night and he said, you know, the number of people who die and hang around their bodies is not small. Because they've identified so strongly with their bodies for so long. When they suddenly find themselves pushed out, they have no idea of anything else that they could be or anywhere else they could go. So imagine what it's like hanging around your own corpse. So at the very least, learn how to get some detachment from your own body. And you'll find that if you get detachment from your own body, then the bodies of other people are less attractive. Because you look at your own body and you say, what could there be of anything that would be attracted there at all? And a lot of the fuel for your fantasies lies in your own sense of your own attractiveness. And when that's gone, there's very little left. So don't be afraid of this practice. There are stories, of course, in the canon of people who do it and they commit suicide, but that's because they haven't monitored their minds properly. If you find yourself getting really disgusted with the body, that's gone too far, in which case you go back to breath meditation. But it's good to have this as part of your repertoire. And John Lee talks about having many topics of meditation as your foraging ground. The breath is home base. The breath is home. It's your secure and safe place. As the Buddha says, when you do other meditation topics and unskillful mind states start developing, you go back to the breath. And as you sweep the breath through the body, sweep the breath through your mind, those unskillful states get washed away. He makes a comparison with the end of the dry season and the beginning of the rainy season. During the dry season in India, there's a lot of dust. As soon as the rain comes, the air clears quite dramatically. In well, the same way, when unskillful mind states come from your alternative meditation topics, you go back to the breath. This applies, say, to contemplation of death. Some people get really depressed when they contemplate their own death. That's taking it in the wrong direction. The contemplation of death is just meant to lead to the deathless. In other words, you realize that you have work that needs to be done. And it's good work. It's the work that's going to help you when you die. All too many people think that when you die there's nothing you can do, you just simply have to accept it, learn how to be okay with the fact that you're dying. But there's a lot more going on. When you leave this body, where are you going to go? If the mind has lots of attachments, it's just going to grab onto whatever comes past out of desperation. There's work to be done so the mind doesn't grab on like that. And so you really can make a difference about in how you die by the preparatory work you do right now. And ideally, when you see the Dhamma, have a glimpse of the deathless, that eradicates a lot of your fear about what's going to happen after death. The canon makes a distinction between the fear of death that's associated with the pain and the illness that may lead up to death, and the fear of what's going to happen after death. 
for stream enters, the fear of what happens after death is gone. The fear of what leads up to death, that can still be there. Or you're not afraid of what's going to happen afterwards because you've seen that the mind has this deathless element. That takes a huge load off the mind. And that's what the contemplation of death is meant to do, is to get you to do the practice and get you there. That's so the contemplation of the body. You begin to realize that it's not so much the body that's the issue, it's your perceptions and intentions around the body. So you learn how to focus there. And here again, perceptions and intentions are going to play a huge role when you pass away. And you want to be able to question your perceptions, question your intentions, and not just run with whatever comes through the mind. So these contemplations are really valuable. They give you alternative themes to focus on when the breath doesn't seem to be offering any anything promising. And they also deal with specific defilements that come up in the mind. So you can recognize, yes, these are defilements. And you can't just say, well, this is the way lust is, I'll be okay with the way the lust is, and that somehow will take away its power. It just weakens it for a little while, but it's going to come back. You've got to really take it apart. Where exactly in the lust is your craving focused? Why is it focused there? Why is there that attraction there that you're so willing to give into? It's only through knowing your own mind in this way that you can get past the tricks that the mind plays on itself. Like the equation of affection with lust. So there's nothing in the contemplation of the body that's in any way contradictory to the Brahma-viharas. In fact, it's part of your way of showing goodwill for yourself, goodwill for the people around you. The less lust you have, the less pride you have in your own body, the less damage you're going to do, both for yourself and for others. So if you have any thoughts that somehow the contemplation of the body is an act of violence, remember the violence is toward your own lust. And your lust is probably what's complaining when there are these complaints about body contemplation. On the one hand, that comes from, from the lust itself. Secondly, from wanting to have a good body image. And there's such a thing as a healthy, positive body image. There's such a thing as a unhealthy, positive body image. Just as there's a healthy, negative image and an unhealthy, negative image. The healthy, positive image is that you've got a body that can practice. You've got a body that's got the breath that you can focus on. It's a good topic. You can fill the body with a sense of rapture and pleasure, rapture and ease, to give the mind a good place to settle down. But the body's good for that. It's good for being generous. It's good for being virtuous. That's a healthy, positive image. The unhealthy, positive image is when you think, I'm attractive. And then there's a the question of how long can you make that lie continue? Because you can't help but look in the mirror and see that there are signs of aging here and signs of this is not quite attractive. And then you have to have other people come and confirmed for you that, yes, you're still attractive, and then you're dependent on them, and then they can manipulate you through your fear of not being attractive. And when you are still young and attractive, then you have that sense that you can manipulate other people through your beauty. All of that's very unhealthy. And so the negative body image, the positive negative body image, is that everybody is composed of the same things. If you took your liver out and put it on the floor, and you took somebody else's liver out and put it on the floor in Miss Americas or whatever, there'd be no competition. There'd be nothing there to attract anything at all. So we're all equal in this sense. And that's a healthy negative image, because it helps you overcome 
the lies that the mind tells itself in order to provoke its lust. Now the unhealthy negative image is that you see other people are attractive and you're not attractive. And you come down hard on yourself for that. That can make you do all kinds of things, have all kinds of resentment, jealousy, low self-esteem, based on what? Something that's made up of hair of the body, hair of the head, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, bones. But it's basically no big deal. So learn how to develop a positive image for your body, a healthy image, and a healthy negative image. Try to get past those unhealthy images, whether they're good or bad. When you can have that kind of attitude to the body, you're not doing violence to anybody at all. It's your act of kindness to yourself. And you can overcome these defilements, it's an act of kindness to everybody around you.